What up, what up, what up, what up, y'all? How's everybody doing? How many of you would say that 2020 was a crazy year? Let me hear you say amen. amen. <laughs> awesome, awesome. There's been crisis after crisis, kind of leaving us a little disoriented. But I just, wanna, I just want you guys to give yourselves a round of applause because you guys made it to this very point. So give yourselves a round of applause. It's been bumpy and it's been rocky. And speaking of rocky, I'm going to go ahead and share this very quick story with you that happened about three years ago. Um, I think it was November 17th of 2017, not to be exact, but um, I was about a year into my, into my faith and I was saved and I was excited and I was fired up for God. And at that time, God kind of just blessed me with a new job. I was making a good amount of money. I had just bought a new car as well. And um, it was pretty awesome because the car that I traded in was a 1998 Honda Accord with over 260,000 miles in it and um, the window was broken so I literally had to tape it up just to keep it up um, but I was able to trade it in for a new Scion FRS and uh, it was definitely by the grace of God but I bought the car and I was feeling on top of the world kind of like how we felt in 2020 saying 2020 is going to be the year of breakthrough the year of vision that's how I felt when God said go to the Grand Canyon and just take a trip this weekend. And I said, okay. And I ended up booking the trip. I packed up my bags and I'm driving right after work. It's about 4.30 PM now. And I'm driving. And as I'm driving, two hours go by and then my check engine light goes on. And I'm like, come on, I just bought this car. It was supposed to be great. The check engine light went on, and then the car started acting a little funky. So I was like, okay, I got to pull over, but I'm two hours out. So I got to call my brother and see what I should do. And he called me, and he said, or I called him, and he said, just come back to San Diego, because that's, that's where I live at, and get my truck and swap it, and you can still leave. So I said, oh, all right. So now it's been four hours of driving. I get the truck. And I start driving again back towards the Grand Canyon. And now it's maybe 10 p.m. at night, and I get hungry. How many of you guys know of a place called Chipotle? Chipotle, mmm, yeah, we don't have it here yet. We're praying, I'm believing that God's going to bring it here one day, along with a Chick-fil-A, praise him. But um, <laughs> I went to a Chipotle, and I got myself a burrito. And I started eating the burrito, and I said, I'm going to take a 15-minute nap. And at that point, I took the 15-minute nap, I woke up, and I said, all right, Let's start driving again. I drove another two hours. Now it's about maybe like 12.30 in the morning, and I'm in between Vegas and Flagstaff. And then I say, oh, my gas is getting a little empty. I got to go get myself some gas. And I pull over, and right when I'm about to go get me some gas, I start checking my pockets. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. I don't have my wallet. And I just, and it, it was like a light bulb came up. And I said, oh my gosh, my wallet is at the Chipotle that was two hours away from here. And now it's maybe 12 to 1 in the morning in the middle of nowhere. And I was like, God, what is happening? I literally pulled over. And I had this type of Job moment where I'm like, God, I, what is happening? I don't drink anymore. I don't hook up with women anymore. I don't party anymore. I just follow you and read my Bible what is the biggest sin about going to the Grand Canyon? And I got to this point where I finally was just fully desperate for God to say something. And God said something through my brother. My brother who was supposed to meet me at the Grand Canyon, he called me and he said, where are you? And he said, I am literally in the stuck, in the, stuck in the middle of nowhere with no money, with no wallet, and my car, I'm using my brother's truck. And he said, okay, how much money is in the truck? Is there any and I said, yeah, there's some quarters. And there was $9 in quarters. So I ended up just getting $9, literally $1, $2, $3, $4. It was mad humbling. And I filled up the tank. And my brother asked me, now can you drive to this spot, which is about 150 miles from your gas station, but can you make it there? And I'll meet you halfway. And I'll give you money so we can still go to the Grand Canyon. And I said, ah, OK, let me, let's do it. So I look up, and I pull up my phone, and I pull up the GPS. I don't know about you guys, but when you guys actually look up a location, there's like three different routes or two different routes you can pick. I practically thought the one with the least miles would be best. But then when I started driving onto that road, 20 minutes go by, and the paved road started turning into a rocky road. And then the rocky road started turning into a dirt road. And then this dirt road kind of looked like this. If you can go ahead and show the picture. Oh, no, the other one. <laughs> that one. 
I was literally in the middle of nowhere by myself. Now it's maybe like 1.30 in the morning, and I'm driving with a certain amount of gas, and I don't even know if I'm going to get there. And as I'm driving, just imagine you see a donkey literally on the left side of the road, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this donkey's going to eat me up. What am I seeing right now? And even as I'm driving some more, I start seeing old houses, and they're kind of like spaced apart, and you see white crosses. And I just remembered that the KKK is actually living in that area. And I said, oh my gosh, the KKK is going to kill me because I'm Filipino and I'm brown. (laughs) And they're going to take me down. And I was like, God, what is happening? And my automatic response was to call my pastor. So I called Brother Will. And I'm like, yo, Brother Will. And then the phone dies or his phone at least dies, or the phone call fails. And I said, oh my gosh, I'm really going to die. What do I do? And then Brother Will texts me, and he says, I know you're afraid, and I know you're scared. But one thing I want you to ask God is, is where is the one place you're afraid to go, but you feel like God is leading you there? And the word that God gave me was forward. And I feel like the word that God has given us for tonight is forward. Because I know that right now we are living in an obscure time where we can't even really see 10 feet or even a month ahead of us of what's really going to happen. But I feel like the fact that we made it through this year is already showing how strong we are. But God is saying in order for us to go into the new year strong, we got to end this year strong, filled with faith. Amen? Amen. So that's why we're going to be talking about regaining sight and reclaiming vision. That is the title of my message tonight. And what the message is going to be framed around is the text of Mark chapter 8, verse 22 through 25. It starts off like this. Then he, Jesus, came to, came to Beth, Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, that's disgusting, and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for the fact that you brought us this far. We know that it's been a crazy, rocky, chaotic, dark type of year for many of us. But we know that the fact that you have sustained us shows shows that you still have purpose for our life and that your plan is to prosper us and never to harm us. So even as we get into this message talking about regaining sight and reclaiming vision, God, I pray that vision is revived today in, in some of these people sitting here. God, I pray that you allow them to just be revived in their dreams and revived in their hope and revived in their faith because we know that 2020 was a year of breaking and 2021 will be the year of breakthrough and we claim that in Jesus' name. But God, we pray that you use me as your own broken vessel and just allow the light of Christ to shine through me so that it can shine onto everybody else here because we know that your plan is good and we know you are a good, good father in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the first thing we're going to go over is our first point and how to regain sight and reclaim vision. And it's to ask God to fully restore your sight. Mark chapter 8, verse 22, he said, Then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. The first key word is they, which means that some other people brought the blind man to Jesus so that he can gain sight. There is a lot of people here that came to know Jesus because a friend, a family member, an auntie or an uncle invited them to church or even just shared their testimony. And it shows that in order for us to reclaim this vision, we can't do it alone. And the second one is begged. The definition of beg is to strongly implore, desire, or appeal for, or even literally just crying out in full desperation, like how I was in the truck, and I was saying, God, what is happening? Where do you want me to go? But it was a full, honest, David-like prayer, where it wasn't like a religious, like, oh, Holy Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, which is a good prayer. But it was like, God, I need your help right now. And I think that God is calling us to really be honest and genuine with him. We could be honest and genuine with our friends, but when it comes to coming into the presence of God, are we honest with the pain that we're feeling? Are we honest with the heartbreak that we're going through? Are we honest with the betrayal that we might have dealt with? Are we even dealing with the doubts that we're even dealing with in our mind and saying, God, this is fully me. Help me. Because, see, God often waits for casual desire to become strong desire before moving. 
In Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 through 8, it says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock on the door and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. What does that mean? Keep on asking until you get an answer. Keep on seeking until you find him. Keep on knocking until that door is open unto you. Knocking in the sense of getting insight from God himself. Because sometimes we knock on the door about maybe three or four times, and we're like, ah, no, okay, I'm done. Or we keep on seeking, but then if you look in the word, it says David was a man after God's own heart. And in the Psalms, it said, God said, seek me after your whole heart, and you will find me. He didn't say, seek me with half of your heart. He didn't say, seek me with a quarter of your heart. He didn't say, seek me with maybe three force of your heart. But he said, seek me with all of your heart. And that includes having to really beg and implore and say, God, I need the insight right now. And I'm not going to stop asking until you give it to me. Because see, sometimes we treat God like he's a genie. All we want is for God to give us stuff. But yet God is saying, don't seek my hand, seek my face. I'm going to say it again. Don't seek my hands, but seek my face. Because the things that we have, and I'm going to say, and I'm going to close it, the rest of my story at the end of this message, but I just want to kind of give a sneak peek is just know that all the stuff that God has given you, it's a gift. But yet that gift is temporary. It will eventually be taken away. But the one who's given you the gift is the one that will last with you forever. And that's your heavenly father that loves you. Amen? Amen. And that's part of the reason of the COVID season. A lot of us have been kind of taken into a place where the only person we can really cling on to is God. And I think I'm going to take this moment to even just be transparent and open with you guys. It's been hard. I mean, even for me as a minister, as a director, it's been very, very hard to the point where, because I'm just going to give you some background. I'm from Los Angeles. If you can't tell, I got my slang, got my vernacular. I say, what up, bruh? But uh, it's been, this was the first holiday season where I didn't spend time with my family. I didn't spend time with my friends. I'm literally on an island where it's like COVID is rampant. And the one person I, I want to see is my mother because she just got healed by COVID-19 a few months ago. But yet for some reason, I'm still here. And even I caught myself seeing, looking at planes flying around and my head would literally just trace the plane and everything inside of me was saying, man, I wish I was on that plane. But God, was, but God was speaking to me, and he said, just like how Jeremiah, Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. Jeremiah had a great ministry, but what he did was he had two converts throughout his whole ministry, but yet he gave a lot of great prophetic words, as in just words into insight, but yet he was known as the one that was afflicted a lot. He was known as the one that went through a lot of suffering. But why does it say in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, that the Lord's plans are to prosper me and never to harm me. How can someone who's crying and literally in so much pain say, his plans are to prosper me, not to harm me? It's because he knew that whether if you're suffering or whether if you're doing great, God is still with you and there's still a purpose, whether if it's a storm or it's a mountaintop. Amen? Amen. Amen. And then as you can see, the blinded man ended up seeing and because they begged him to touch him. And the second point that we need to do is nurture your faith and quarantine your doubt. Mark chapter 8, verse 23, it says, So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. He said, and previously he did the same thing with the deaf man, which we'll talk about for next week, but Mark chapter 7, verse 32 through 35, it says, And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears, and after splitting, touched his tongue, and looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha. That is, be opened, and his ears were opened. Isn't that kind of weird how Jesus does that? First, he spit on his hands, and then he put it, puts it on your eyes. That definitely would not be okay with COVID-19. But then having to spit on your hands and then putting it on your ear? Sometimes God will bring clarity through very unusual moments and very unusual circumstances. Sometimes God will show up in a way that you would never expect. But we're going to go ahead and take the text and see that Jesus quarantined the blind man away from the town to isolate the virus of doubt that lived in the people. And even speaking on that, there was a quick story that I had to go through when I first got saved and I was really fired up. And I, I got filled with the Holy Spirit one day in my pastor's living room. And when I got filled up with the Holy Spirit, I felt on top of the world. My pastor was like, how do you feel? I said, I feel like I'm on cloud nine. 
And then five days later, that cloud nine feeling in that plane went straight down. Why did it go down? Because my roommates had a, had her birthday at the apartment that I was staying in, and I started partying, and I started drinking, and I almost hooked up with a girl that night. Praise God, I didn't. But the next day, I felt empty and broken again. So I go to Brother Will, and I'm like, yo, what happened? And he said, it's because you sinned. And every time you do that, you get disconnected from God. And even though you're forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ, you're still going to feel the repercussions of your actions every single time. And then right after he said that, Lake Davis, another man who prayed for me, came right behind him like this. And he said, hey, God told me to tell you to embrace being alone for this season. And he said, I'm not saying you can't hang out with your buddies and your friends and your brothers forever, but just right now, you're not emotionally or spiritually mature enough to say no to the temptation that's in front of you. Because he said about nourishing your faith. What does nourish mean? Or nurture. Nurture means to nourish and to also protect it's like you're taking a seed of the gospel and the seed of faith, and when you put it into the ground and the plant is still really young, it starts sprouting out. But if the wind comes up, if it's a shallow type of faith, what's going to happen? It's going to be uprooted. But then, so what do you have to do? You have to guard it. But then once that faith is truly nurtured, then you can be able to let go of the guardrail a little bit. And then when every wind of false doctrine or tribulation comes, it's going to be a tree and oak of righteousness. So it will stand its ground in the face of whatever tribulation comes its way. Amen. So, he, so I had to do that. And Jesus had to do that with the blind man because he knew that the, that the virus of doubt was living in the people in Bethsaida. Because even, even at that moment, when Jesus came to bring the gospel to those people in that village and in that town, they rejected him. So he knew he had to call out the few, and he had to bring the blind man out, and he knew that if he was going to keep his faith, he needed to allow him to be separated from them. Sometimes that's some of us, right? I, I, I feel led to say this too, is I mean, maybe some of us said like, man, what happened to my friends that I had in the beginning of 2020? And then now at the end of 2020, it's like they're not here anymore. What happened to my brothers and my cousins and my friends that were there for me and then out of nowhere, boom, they vanish. Maybe it's because God is saying you might have outgrew them for a season. Or maybe God is saying because I'm calling you out to, great, to a greater purpose and to a greater place of destiny. And then the second thing is, is that also what you're guarding it from is from the enemy as well. Because the enemy is always attacking our faith because it is the one thing that pleases the heart of God and moves the hand of God. There are three enemies, the flesh, the world, and the enemy. I'm going to talk about two today, which is the world, which is the society and the culture that we live in. So that's why I want to say, if you are only taking all the data and internalizing it from ESPN or from the New York Times or from the social media or from what people are posting, then obviously you're going to be internally chaotic. But if you're going to take in the word of God and if you're going to let the spirit fill you up, then you're going to be walking in peace. Because what we internalize can either breed fear or faith. So we need to make sure that we guard our focus. Second one, or next point, is a climate of doubt negates a climate of faith. A climate of doubt negates a climate of faith. Throughout the Gospels, we see that people were in a room of healing, but they were in a distinct line of separation. Because some people who doubted, they knew that if faith wasn't there, miracles wouldn't happen. You look at Jesus, he said, I didn't go to my hometown. I went to my hometown, and there were no miracles because of the unbelief of the people at that town. And it was because of their unbelief. So as you can see, we got to nurture, care for, and encourage the growth or development of our faith. And we can see that our faith has been awakened or reawakened during this pandemic. And we need to make sure that we do the next point, which is keep praying for clarity. Mark chapter 8, verse 23 through 25, it says, and when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. As you can see, what happened was, was that clarity came after the second time that Jesus prayed. The first time Jesus prayed, he put his hands on his eyes. And then he said, okay, now look up. What do you see? And he said, ah, I see men walking like trees. That means it was a little blurry. That means his vision was blurred and he couldn't see clearly. So what did Jesus do again? He said, all right, we're going to do it again. Let me spit in my hands. Boom, second time. 
And then after the second time, he said, look up. And it was fully restored and he was able to see clearly. So now what we need to take from this is that if Jesus needed to ask twice and he was the son of God able to do the miracles that he has done, don't you think that we need to ask maybe once or, to- or twice or three times or four times or five times for whatever we're believing in or whatever we're praying for? Because God wants us to be relentless and to be determined in our prayer. And also knowing that clarity comes gradually and we can see clearer as the light gets brighter. What does that mean? It means that clarity doesn't come overnight, but it comes with every step that you take. Because the thing is, is that God is only going to show you your next step, right? Just like I said before, if you guys have heard it, you don't need to see the whole staircase to take your first, to, to, take, to literally take your first step. You just need to step in faith and you'll get on top of it eventually. Can you put one foot in front of the other? When God told me to go forward, I ended up going forward. But he said this, he said, God needs us to move, to move us forward so we don't get stuck. And we need to realize that there could be no spiritual vision with the light of, without the light of God's presence. And in John chapter eight, verse 12, it says, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And now we also have to do this. The more we pray, the more we reflect. I don't know if you've ever heard of the word Selah, but the definition of the word, some scholars believe that Selah was a musical notation, possibly meaning silence or pause. Means that when you pray, you pause, then you listen. Some of us keep on going, God, I need this. God, I need that. God, I'm just going crazy right now. And then you just keep on talking and talking and talking and talking, and then you leave. But God is saying, when you pray, can you pause enough so that you can hear me? Can you pause enough so that I can show you the divine revelation of what I'm actually doing in your life? Because he's saying faith is the evidence of the assurance of things unseen. God is saying, can you allow me to show you some of the things that are unseen? Because you're talking about sight, right? But the blind man didn't just get physical sight, he got spiritual sight. And God wants to give you guys spiritual sight, but not even just spiritual sight, but spiritual insight. But how does that happen? By taking that time of pausing, of reflecting, of praying, of coming into the presence of God and saying, God, I need you to speak to me. Okay, let me say everything I need to say, and then I'll shut my, you know. And then as we do that, we're going to act. And the more we act on what we, re- on what we reflect on, the more God reveals. I was reflecting on this past year. And I realized that I can either do two things. I can either take my focus and look at how my mom almost died from COVID-19, or I can take a look at the promise that was on the other side of it and seeing that that led to me baptizing my parents and leading them to the Lord. So I'll be able to spend eternity with them. So the question is, is the focus? And that only happened when I said, God revealed to me, what are the good things in my life? What are the great things, even in the midst of this storm? So in my brokenness, I found clarity as I step forward. And now, as we bring this portion to a close, I want to go ahead and conclude with with the ending of the story of the Grand Canyon. And as I was literally driving and God said, go forward, I literally saw nothing but 15 feet ahead of me. And I said, God, I'm so scared. I don't know about you, but there were times where I pulled over and I stopped and I said, I had to talk myself into it. I said, okay, God is telling me, I'm just gonna keep on going. And as I kept on driving, I finally got to this Carl's Jr. at like five in the morning and I pulled over and I said, I'm going to take maybe a 30 minute nap because I've been driving for like 24 hours. So I was exhausted. And when I took the nap, I woke up, it was maybe about 45 degrees outside and I was freezing and I was still feeling like I was in the worst season of my life. I started driving out. And then once I started driving out, I saw the sun coming over the horizon. And then this is actually kind of what I saw. If you want to want to show that picture. I saw the sun coming over the horizon and with a darkness that was covering the beauty that God was leading me to, I realized that sometimes we find the greatest masterpiece in the dark as long as we continue to step forward and let, let God's light shine continuously and also gradually. Because even when I got there, I realized like, man, I felt this joy and I felt this peace and long story short, from there I, I met my brother at the gas station 
And literally I got right to the gas station and then the car died and then he was able to fill it up. We had a great and amazing time. But when I started driving back, this is what happened. When I started driving back, I was like, my brother gave me 40 bucks and he said, just use this for gas and you could get back to the Chipotle where you left your wallet. And I said, okay. So I started driving and I realized I needed to get gas again. And as I pulled over, I saw this woman with a sign. She was literally parked on the side of the street and it said, need gas for money, don't have any money. And when I saw that, usually everything inside of me would say, ah, oh, I can't give her money because I only got 40 bucks. I don't have my wallet. I would have came up with every single excuse not to bless that woman. But when I looked at her and I saw her, I saw myself in that same position three days ago. So when I, so I filled up, I maybe got like $20 in gas. And then, I, and then after, I parked next to her, I got out the car and I said, hey, God bless you. And then right when I gave her the cash, she started bawling. But then when she started bawling and crying, ex crying profusely, her son came out from the back seat. It was like a two-year-old kid just literally crawling out, looking like the cutest thing ever. And when I got into my car and I started driving, I felt the Holy Spirit just come over me in a way I never felt. And God was telling me right then and there, he said, the reason why I had you walk through that is because I only took two things away from you, your car and your wallet. But yet, since you built your life on that foundation and you forgot who gave you the gift, I took out two things and it came down like a house of cards. I feel led to say that some of us have might have had our foundation shaken by this year because God wanted to reveal to us that our foundation was never even really in him in the first place. And I'm saying that out of experience. I'm saying that out of something that I had to go through and I had to grow through. And this year is, some, is a year that God wants to grow you, but the question is, will you reflect and look at the lessons that came from January all the way to today? Because if you look at yourself in the mirror, you'll say, man, I'm a completely different person. I'm stronger in my faith. I'm stronger in my belief system. I actually kind of know who I am now because I'm not so busy doing stuff just to do stuff. But God is saying now, what I want you to do is take this vision, pray for clarity, and also know that you can't do this alone and continue to nourish your faith and quarantine your doubt so that when you go into 2021, you will literally see the year of breakthrough. But one thing I also want to leave you with is this, is the light that was shining over the horizon. To me, it represented the light of Christ. And we know that vision can only come from Jesus Christ and him alone. What did it say? Jesus Christ is the light of the world and whoever follows him will never walk in darkness. We've had a very dark year. We've had a very hard year. We've had, we've had a year where we might have cried the most we've cried ever in our life. But yet Jesus is still saying, I am still the light. And no matter how long this tunnel may be, my light is at the end of that tunnel. And there is vision for all of you, as long as you continue to seek after Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you. And that's why what we're gonna do is we're gonna partake of communion so that we can go ahead and remind ourselves of what the gospel is really all about.